Well, good morning, everybody. It's so good to see you here. So good to be with you. I don't know about you, but uh, this week has been one of those one of those kind of weeks. It's been a week of lots of mixed emotions. Um, you know, we had. On Tuesday, Enoch Holloway celebrated his first birthday. Just a huge answer to prayer. While on Wednesday, as Van prayed, Adam Mays had the funeral for his dad. And just the heartbreak of that. Today, today is my parents' 51st anniversary. They're, they're here. I don't know why they wanted to spend their anniversary with us, but they came that's a pretty exciting thing. 51 years. That's. But then also today is the one year anniversary of Larry Killian going home to be with the Lord. And there's just a lot of ups and downs. A lot of, a lot of things to rejoice over and a lot of things that are just heartaches. And certainly in a room this size, there's no doubt that there are probably other people who are in the midst of something that is really difficult. A trial of some kind. Maybe you're hurting or you're confused or you're angry at God. I get that. Or maybe you're coming out of a trial and you're surprised that you actually made it through upright. Or if, if you think you're in the clear, Buckle up, because without a doubt, everybody faces them. So if you, you're not in the midst of one, you're not coming out of one, you're for sure heading toward one. That's just the way life is. So whatever you're going through, wherever you are right now, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're taking the time to spend with the Lord and to be able to open up God's word with us. You know, I often say when I preach that I'm speaking to myself as much as I might be speaking to any of you. Um, and today's passage is probably more true of that than any other one that I've ever done. Um, yeah. There, there, are, there are certain times just as I prepare this that, that God got a hold of me and just wouldn't let me go. And so, so because of that, I need to give just a little bit of a confession just to start off, okay? You know those times where you come to church and you see in your bulletin an outline or something, you know, there's introduction, three points, and a conclusion. And usually I'm, I'm pretty guilty of this, where the first point, the pastor spends like 75% of his time on the first point, and the second point might get like 24.5%. And then the last point is like 30 seconds and it's just, that might be true today. Just, just so you know, if you're eager to kind of get through everything or whatever, it, it may be that way. Only because you'll see that at a certain point, I think this is where God was kind of beating up on me in, in a gentle way, but still kind of, kind of hit me a little bit. This, so, so if you have your Bibles... Please open up to the book of James, chapter 1, and we're going to be looking at verses 19 through 27, and, and some of these verses may be familiar to, to you, um, but we want to look at them and look at them in context and look at them how we as a church can apply them so that we are living the life that God has called us to. So pray with me. Our great Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for who you are and what you have done. And it's because of, because of you and because of what Jesus has done that we are here together. And Father, we know that you are here, and that you're, you've given us your spirit to speak to us. And so I do pray that, that we would be open to listening to what you have to say. That the, the words, the words that are your words would not just go in one ear and out the other, but they would, 
that they would penetrate our hearts. They would affect our actions um, so that we can live a life of victory and joy uh, as you've called us to live. So speak to us today. Continue speaking to me as we open up your word. So I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in 1991, just a few years ago, I went to a concert at the Pontiac Silverdome up just a little bit north of Detroit. And I don't know how many of you remember the the Christian artist Carmen. Uh, You know, not the opera Carmen, but the Christian artist Carmen. Um, And it was one of those concerts. It It was a free concert at the Pontiac Silverdome. And the Silverdome itself sat about 80,311 people, just about 80,311. And usually for a concert like that or a basketball game, the Pistons used to play there, they would cut off half of the, the arena. arena. So, so you could fit in probably 40,155 and a half people in half of the, the Silverdome. And I don't know how many tickets were given out for this concert, Again, free, so like anybody could have gone. So let's just say half of them were given out. So 20,077 and three quarter people were at this free concert. And if you're familiar with, the, with Carmen, great singer, great lyrics, very energetic. And there's one song that he sang that goes like, no way, and everybody chants this as we start this song, no way. We are not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. And a lot of his songs talk about how we are supposed to live out our faith. And it was exciting. It was exhilarating. And it was like, it was great to be in a room with at least maybe 20,000 people who are saying the same things. But at a certain point in the midst of that, even as we are saying these things, that we're not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, it really struck me as odd that I was in or near the city of Detroit that had this reputation for being the murder capital of the United States. And I couldn't understand how if 20,000 people were not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, how is it that our city wasn't transformed to be something better than it was. Now, in 1991, Detroit wasn't the murder capital of the United States anymore. It was three. It was number three, you know. So, still kind of pretty bad reputation for it. But there was some obvious disconnect, at least that I felt in my heart, that there was some disconnect between what 20,000 people were saying they believed and how that li- was actually lived out practically within our community. Because if 20,000 people were truly not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, our city would have looked drastically different. I mean, after all, 12 people turned the world upside down. You know, Christianity went from being a, a handful of ragtag fishermen and uneducated people to becoming the most influential belief system in the entire world. That was because of what they knew and what they believed and what they chose to do with those beliefs that turned the world upside down. And so these few verses that we're going to look at in James today teaches us that holding fast to God's goodness makes hearers of God's word actual doers of God's word. So I want to read these verses together. And if you wouldn't mind, please stand with me and follow along as I read these verses. And Noah, if you wouldn't mind just moving through these slides for me so I don't have to pay attention to that as I'm reading. But Just follow along with me. This is James chapter 1, verses 19 through 27. It says, My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, 
slow to speak and slow to become angry because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. But not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves, or do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves, and the religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless as this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the word. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. You may be seated. So, if you, if you have your notes there in the back of the bulletin, uh, there's some spots that you can fill in the blanks as you go along. But most of us, when we read James, we, we kind of come to it as a, sort of this compilation of different exhortations uh, that we should know and that will help us live our Christian life. And it's true. There, there are a bunch of those in there. There are a variety of different wise things from God's word that God is saying to us of how we should live out our, our faith. But despite the section break that we have in most of our Bibles, despite that, this section is continuing the thought from the previous 18 verses. It's, it's not that James is just just abruptly shifting from a new thought, uh, to a new thought from his previous one. He's not just saying, all right, you know, if you remember the first few verses talked about suffering and having joy in the midst of our trials. He's not just saying, all right, there's suffering. Now, hey, do what God's word says. You know, that's, that, that would be too much of an abrupt shift. So this section is not a complete change in topic. Rather, it, it's giving practical, practical guidance for overcoming various trials. So let's look at the context just a little bit. So, so let's remember who James is writing to. He's writing to persecuted Christians who were once part of the Jerusalem church, but they're now scattered throughout various Gentile communities. So he's writing to Christians who are scattered throughout the, the region, and they're scattered because of persecution and things that they've faced. And it, what is his message to these scattered believers? Well, in verse 2, he writes that we should that they should, and that we should as well, but they should consider it all joy when they face various trials. You know, and, and these trials come in various forms, right? As Pastor Greg pointed out the last couple of weeks, you know, these people were under persecution. These people were having this the fear of being dragged away beaten, possibly killed. You know, some pretty big and scary, life-altering trials, I'd say. They're not just minor conveniences, you know, like when we get the wrong thing at McDonald's. You know, we don't get the ketchup in our bag. You know, but anybody who has faced some kind of tragedy or injustice can attest to the fact that that trial is a challenge in their belief in God. 
You know, in fact, verse 3 actually says that those tests of your faith. You know, we do have a various different things. There are things that are trials that kind of, you know, they test us, but they don't really get us to question God. You know, they, they might question reality. They might question them. But there's sometimes we face things where we start to wonder, this doesn't line up with what I know or what I think I know about God. And it becomes this crisis of faith. And that's one of the things that could be going on here in, in, uh, in and among these believers. There are other trials that come in the form of temptation, right? You know, verses 12 through 15 talk about that. And temptations could be a whole lot of variety of different things. Our lust and greed or, or whether or not you should cheat on a test. You know, and if you don't think that that is a real trial, you know, you haven't looked at a Christian bookstore lately that says, you know, there's a whole series of books of every man's battle and every young man's battle. Like, those trials of temptation of lust and things like that really affect the way that we grow and interact and, and view ourselves and view God. I don't know, a single man single young man who hasn't at some point in their life said, God, please take away these feelings of lust that I have because I know that's not what I want for myself and I know that's not what you want for me. That's a trial. I'd even argue that another one of those trials that James is talking about in these first few sections is that that a person's socioeconomic status, or their wealth, or their prosperity, or their blessing, can in and of itself be a trial as well. There's hints of that in verses 9 through 11. But look quickly there at verse 16, where it says, Do not be deceived, my dear brothers. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. Clearly, if he's saying, don't be deceived about the good things that are coming down, that there are obviously some people who are being deceived about where those good things are coming from. I know I've dealt with that. I'm sure some of you have too, where you are feeling blessed. You, you recognize that you are having it good at the moment. But it's real easy for us to say, you know what? I have it good at the moment because I worked hard for that. I deserve that. that that's something that everyone, you know, is supposed to have, right? And James says, you know, don't be deceived. Your good and perfect gift comes from God. So certainly, you can even look at just blessing as a trial of how we should be viewing it and think of it. So what does James say about how we can navigate our various trials so that we can consider them pure joy? Because that's what he starts with, right? Count it all joy when you face these things. Well, in verse 5, he says that we should ask for wisdom. Ask God how to navigate these various trials. And as you know, and we've already talked, wisdom is the ability to perceive the true nature of a situation and implement God's will in that situation. Wisdom is the practical application of God's truth to a specific situation. Wisdom is knowing what God wants you to do and then doing it. So all this to say, just by means of introduction, <laughs> that this passage that we're studying today 
is a continuation of James' first significant point about how to deal with various trials. Now, now please don't misunderstand me. All, all, all the r- probably really good sermons you've heard about this that just talk about knowing God's truth and doing God's truth are still fitting and appropriate. You know, the, the truths there in these nine verses apply to many, many different areas of the Christian life. And probably, quite frankly, they're a little bit easier to teach on and apply as a completely separate section. But the context of what James is saying here is really important. So we're going to do our best to look at these verses within that context and figure out how we can apply that together when we are going through trials. That sound good? I hope so, because that's what we're going to do. So, all right, so I'd say... That's in this that there are five keys to navigating through trials. So I'm going to give you all five of them right now just so you can fill them in and feel like you accomplished something. They're not necessarily here in order that you would find them as, as you're reading through the passage. But it's the order that we're going to go over them today. But you got these five. The first key to navigating is just to be quiet. So the second key is to be mindful of your anger. The third one is to listen. The fourth one is to reject sin. And the fifth one is to do what God says. So let's look at the first one together, shall we? First key for us to navigate through life's trials is just to be quiet. Now, those of you who know me, I, I, I wanted to just say the first key was like to shut up. But, you know, a lot of people don't like using that phrase. I'd probably get in trouble if I did. So I'm not saying to shut up, okay? Because actually that, that's not what it says. It doesn't say to shut up. I thought it would get your attention a little bit better. But anyway, verse 19 says that we should be slow to speak. There is a time to speak, but it shouldn't be our first reaction. Speaking should be something that comes a little bit later. As Ecclesiastes says, To everything there is a season. Verse 7, chapter 3, I believe it is, is there's a time to speak and a time to be silent. Turn, turn, turn. If you don't get that, talk to somebody a lot older than you. So this idea here of being slow to speak was already touched on a little bit in verse 12, but we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on that, but verse 12 it says, don't say when you're tempted that God is the one tempting me. Then he goes on to say how temptation should work. But even in this little section, he gets to the heart of what is meant here. That when we face a trial, a tragedy, an injustice of some sort, There are a lot of different thoughts that come to our mind. A lot of different words that we want to say. I know. After my son died a few years ago, there are a lot of things that I wanted to say. When Greene County took away our foster kids last year, unfairly and unjustly and accusing us of things that just weren't true, There are a lot of things that I wanted to say. And if I'm honest, there are a lot of things I did say. But rather than saying whatever it is that we're feeling, it's appropriate to take our time and be slow to speak. Now, it doesn't say what that should look like. It doesn't say that you should take deep breaths or that you should 
count to 10 or do whatever it takes to slow you down. But it does say we should be slow to speak. So what are the kind of things that we're tempted to say when we face a trial? Well, let me give you some examples from what I wanted to say. (laughs) Sometimes we just want to accuse God. How could God have done this to me? Where is God in this moment? If God's here, he certainly can't be good. God must be powerless to act. God must not really love me. Or if he does love me, he must not like me. Or why should I bother? The bad guys always win, right? So sometimes we just accuse God. Sometimes we accuse or judge or we eviscerate or condemn or we attack or we vilify or demonize the other person. The person who might have committed this injustice toward us. I hope that person rots in hell. I'm sure none of you have ever said that, right? I've said that. I know better. I hope they get what they deserve. Or sometimes we say things just about ourselves. You know, that we are unlovable or we're undeserving or something that that certainly doesn't align up with what God says about us. In that moment. One of the reasons, and there are lots of them throughout scripture, but one of the reasons James is saying here that we should be slow to speak. Proverbs 10 says it this way. Where words are many, sin is not absent. Sometimes when we speak, we are not speaking love and life and truth and Jesus into situations. Sometimes we are speaking the opposite of what God would have for us. So when we're going through a trial, we need to take some time to keep our mouth shut just for a few minutes or a few days you know, you, you look at the book of Job and you see all the, how that played out there. Job and his friends sat quietly in an ash heap for a week, not saying anything. Now, even that didn't really help with some of the thoughts and the advice that the friends gave. But at least they took the time to just sit and ponder the, the immensity of the situation that Job was going through to grieve it and to just be in that moment. Sometimes we need to just take the time to wait. To wait and not say what we're thinking or feeling. Well, the second key in this is to be mindful of your anger. So verse 19 and 20 talks about that we should be slow to get angry. It doesn't say don't get angry. It says to be slow to be angry. You know, often our anger is natural. Or even at times it's appropriate. It's an appropriate kind of response to the suffering or the injustice that you're going through. When you've been betrayed or lied to or abused or violated in some way, anger can be natural and appropriate. 
We shouldn't be the type of person who goes from zero to 100 at the drop of a hat. I think all of us know somebody who's like that. You know, you can do something small and that person will, you know, you thought everything was fine and all of a sudden they're way up here. Like, whoa, where did that anger come from? We as believers should be people who know how to handle our anger properly. Even in the worst of situations, we shouldn't allow our anger to consume us. The reason is anger closes our mind to God's truth. Anger clouds the atmosphere where righteousness should flourish. There's no way that it would be possible for us to consider our trials as pure joy if we feel anger towards the other person or towards God. We'll never take away from the situation what God wants us to take away from it if anger is something that is quick to raise its head. So we need to learn to be quiet, be slow to speak. We need to be mindful of our anger. I just saw this meme on Facebook this week. I just thought it was uh, appropriate. It's not from the Bible, so you know, it, you know, you know don't, don't take this away as some kind of, of biblical thing, but you can't see a reflection in boiling water. Similarly, truth can't be seen in a state of anger. When the water's calm, clarity comes. You know, it's, it's not from the Bible, but it does kind of have a biblical truth in that, in that when our mind is clouded with anger, and those bubbles are, are coming out everywhere in our brain and our, our thinking and our emotions, we can't see clearly what God would have us to see. But when we are slow to anger, when we're evaluating, when we see the appropriate way to direct our anger, then we can have a bit of clarity in terms of how to go about it. And that clarity comes within the third key here, is that we should be listeners. We should listen. Again, in verse 19, that we should be quick to listen. You know, doesn't need to, doesn't say that we should be quick listeners, you know, like a lot of us husbands or a lot of our teenagers who are quick to, yeah, I heard what you said, and it goes in one ear and out the other, right? You know, that, that's a quick listener. That never happens in when you're lecturing, right? People are hearing quickly and didn't really get, catch what you say, but if we listen first before we speak or act, then it begs the question, what are we, should we be listening to? When we're going through dark moments, where should we turn to hear what we need to hear? And I can tell you this, it's not often to ourselves and our own self-speak. You know, I just gave you examples of the things that and pretty much all of them that I gave earlier were things that I said and I felt when our family was going through some of those dark situations. Sometimes our emotions lead us to say and do the wrong things. So we don't want to listen to ourselves. I can also promise you this. It's not in Facebook or in TikTok or on Instagram, or any of the other social media outlets that are out there. It's not Dr. Phil. It's not Fox News. It's not Ben Shapiro or Matt Walsh, even if they do have some good things to say. It's not even necessarily our friends. And I dare to say, it's not 
necessarily even me or your other pastors. Although hopefully, if you're listening to, to us, you'll get good input. If we're going to listen, we need to be listening to God and to God himself, to God's word. And I'll be honest, this is where I got tripped up this week. As I realized that in the midst of the trial that I face, that I often find myself listening to my emotions or even maybe the, the, the cultural signals around me. I find myself listening to common sense, whatever that means, rather than listening to the truth of God's word. It's really easy to forget what God has to say about life. So let me just share a few verses that we all need to listen to and that if we don't have these memorized so that they come to heart when we're in the midst of something, then we're going to be missing out on what we really should be listening to in the midst of a trial. A lot of these come from Romans 8. A lot of these you'd be familiar with. Romans 8, 18, that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Whatever you're going through, there is something better on the other side. Don't compare what you're going through now as this is all that God has for you. God has something more on the other side if you're in Christ Jesus. Romans 8, 26 God helps us in our weaknesses. We did not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. When you don't know what to pray, when you're struggling so hard that you don't know what to pray, you don't even want to pray, God will help us with that. The Spirit will intercede for us. He hears what we're going through on the inside. It's important to know that. Verse that most of us know, Romans 8, 28, we know that all things, that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. You know, sometimes we take this out of context, but the truth is there that in whatever we're going through, like God can work it out toward our good. It may not feel good. The death of a loved one doesn't feel right. So how is God going to work it out for our good? You may not know that answer yet. We need to hear and listen that that is true and trust God in that. Romans 8.31, if God is for us, who can be against us? When somebody is treating you harshly with injustice, when they're saying awful things about you, when the county was saying awful things about us as a family, I don't care that they're against us. God is for me. It doesn't matter if you think your professors are against you. They're not, but it doesn't matter if you think that they are. God is for you. Your family might feel like they're against you. God is for you. Our culture is definitely against us. God is for us. And these come from later part in Romans 8. And I heard this a number of times this week. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? 
No. In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor demons, nor the present nor the future, nor any powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. If we're tempted to say that because of what I'm going through, God doesn't love me. These verses promise us that there is nothing that's going to take God's love away. There is nothing that is going to take you away from God's love. Nothing will separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Nothing. Nothing. You know what nothing means? Nothing can do it. Just a few more. Again, this is where God kept taking me this week. Truths that I need to be listening to. Romans 12, 19 through 20. And don't take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. But on the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed them. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not overcome do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. <laughs> Pastor Will talked about this at the Martin Luther King service on Monday night. That was one of the things that made Martin Luther King Jr. as effective as he was, was that he knew that in the midst of hate and intolerance and racism, that as a believer, it wasn't his job to take revenge that evil could be overcome with the good that God has for us. There's another one. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of, of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Need a few more? I did. Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. This is what we need to listen to. This is what I needed to listen to. I am not prone to loving my enemies, and I'm certainly not prone to praying for them. Unless it's praying for their demise, but that's not what God is saying in this. Do good to them that hate you. Do good to, to those who hate you. That's not what we often want to do. There's one, a couple more. Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And I think these next couple of verses get to everything that we don't do when it comes to social media. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. These are just a few, a few of the truths of God's words, the things that we should be listening to when we are going through difficult times. These are the things that we should be quick to listen to. 
If we're hearing these things, as we'll get to in a minute, applying these things, obeying and doing these things, the slow to speak and the slow to get angry will be a lot easier. All right. There's a lot more blanks on your page that we want to fill in, right? So this is where I spent a lot of my time this week, but this is where I'm going to have to go through a little quicker. So, All right, so the fourth key here is reject sin. Verse 21 says, Get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, and accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Now, accepting God's word goes back to the listening to the right things. The author of Hebrews in chapter 12, verse 1 says this, that we should throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles so that we can run the race with perseverance that's marked out before us. You know, James says, get rid of. I said, reject. Hebrew says, throw off. Paul in Colossians says, put to death whatever belongs to your earthly nature. Paul says, kill it. We'll never live a victorious Christian life if we embrace our sin and choose to let it hold sway in our life. Likewise, we'll have a pretty difficult time navigating through life's most difficult trials if we're holding on to our sin. Our sin robs us of joy and it hinders the fruit of the Spirit Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, patience. I might have missed a few. I might have added a few, but they're all true. What sin does do, it produces guilt and fear and anger. It robs us of our hope and our joy and produces doubt and depression and so much more. If we're going to navigate life's trials, we need to, to put aside our sin. We need to reject sin. There's so much more I could say about that. Our next one, and this really kind of gets to the heart of this entire passage, is to do what God says. Verse 22 do not merely listen to the word and so deceive ourselves. Do what it says. I think that there's a key verse in all of this section. It's that. Once you've heard God's word, we need to do it. We need to put it into practice. You know, maybe we Christians need to take a page out of the Nike playbook, right? Just do it. James uses this great analogy of looking into a mirror. And this analogy works because we've all done it, right? I mean, how many times did we probably did that this morning even, right? We're looking in the mirror, we're getting ready. Okay, not everybody apparently did that, but um, we're looking in the mirror, we're getting ready, we're primping, we're combing our hair, you know, we're popping that last zit that, you know, we're doing all this stuff. We step away and then all of a sudden, wait. You know, just, just one last time. I forgot, did, did I, which, way, which way did I comb my hair this morning? You know, we look in the mirror and we forget. And probably for some of us, that's a good thing. You know, we don't know. We don't, Well, that's what it's like when we hear God's word and we don't put it into practice. It's like, and the one thing I like about this analogy too is that it's talking about forgetting. Because I think amongst us as believers, those of us who have been a part of the church for a long time, it's not that we don't know. And it's probably not that we're actually often rejecting it. Although sometimes that's true. Sometimes we just forget 
like this picture. Norman Rockwell is one of my favorite artists, but I like this. This is called the triple self-portrait. It's weird because there's actually eight self-portraits in it, but it's called the triple self-portrait. But it, you get the idea of what he's doing in order to paint the picture of himself. He's looking in the mirror, and if you could see this sort of animated, he's going back and forth between, oh, this is what I look like. Oh, I'm going to draw this part of my nose. I'm going to do this here. I'm going to do this part of my ear. And he's going back and forth to make that work. Because when we look in the mirror, we, as soon as we turn away, turn to another page, turn to another thing in life, we forget. And that's often what we're like when it comes to listening to and hearing God's commands for us. We hear it, we think it's a good idea, some good truths to listen to, but then as soon as we're faced with something else, we forget what we just heard. And then we don't put it in the practice. But James says, rather than looking into a mirror, that we should look into the perfect law that gives freedom. And there's a whole other sermon that could be done in that one, so we don't have time for that, but we need to look into God's word. I mean, we're going to sing this song later. Sometimes we just need to look into the face of Jesus. We need to turn our eyes to Jesus. And as the song says, when we turn our eyes to him, the things of this earth will go strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Leads to me to one of my favorite quotes. I'm sure I've shared this before. When it comes to doing God's word, Chesterton says this, the Christian ideal has not been found tried and found wanting. It's been found difficult and left untried. Forgiving those who hurt us or offend us or done us wrong, it's difficult difficult. And so you know what? We just choose not to do it. Yet we know from experience, or from examples we see in Bible stories, or examples from our brothers and sisters in Christ, that forgiveness works. It does amazing things. But either we forget, or we just choose not to. All right, I promised I would not go over today. So for the sake of time, I'm going to give you these results of being a doer. And I'm going to try and go quickly. First one is righteousness. Verse 20, and it's related specifically to this idea of anger. But when we do what God says, it gives us a fertile soil where righteousness can grow in our life. It talks about this further in, in chapter 3, verse 18, but... Instead of being anger, angry, if we're peacemakers who sow peace, then a harvest of righteousness can grow. And it's not just righteousness for us. Although I think that's specifically what he's getting at in here in these verses, that it's righteousness that God wants to build up in our life. But it's righteousness, I think, for the person that's offended us too. If we allow our anger to rise up to the surface, especially if it's directed toward the person who hurt us or who offended us or caused our suffering, then we're putting up the kind of walls of righteousness that God desires for their life. As Christians, as people who have been forgiven of our sins and our wrongdoing and our offenses toward God, we should always desire that even our enemies should come to Christ. So the result of being a doer is that there becomes a, a ripe field for righteousness. The second one is rescued. Verse 21. It says that we should hear the word that is planted in you which can save you. And I don't 
believe that this is talking about salvation? Because as we said before, he's already talking to people who are believers, right? So it's not talking about them being saved if they hear this or receive this. He's talking about it saving them, rescuing them from the situation that they're in. God's word will rescue us from the weight of our trials. It will rescue us from the emotions that tend to override the truth. It will rescue us from the bitterness and despair or vengeance or just all the other difficult things that come through it. Third result is reward. Verse 25 says that if you obey, do what he says, then you'll be blessed in what you do. It doesn't say specifically how you'd be blessed. He's already talked about joy or maturity or, or verse 12, he mentions receiving the crown of life that God has promised to all who loved him. But there's blessing in doing what God says. And the last one is right religion. If anyone considers himself religious and yet does not keep a tight rein on his tongue, he deceives himself and his religion is worthless. If you don't hear anything else that I've said today, take this away. Hear this. Because James was talking to a, a bunch of believers, and so I'm assuming that most of us in this room are believers too. But religion that does not transform the heart, and thus our tongue, and thus our actions, if our religion doesn't transform those things, then our religion is worthless. True religion is not someone who can quote all 107 question and answers from the Westminster Shorter Catechism. It's not somebody who knows 100 Bible verses or can speak Christianese fluently. And he gives this example of true religion Pure and undefiled religion is somebody who visits widows and orphans in their distress. When my wife and I first started doing foster care 12 years ago, when we were going through the training classes, I thought everybody, Christians and non-Christians alike, should go through it. It wasn't being taught by believers, but you certainly saw that the people that they were talking about, foster kids who needed foster care, because of no fault of their own, were found in a situation where they couldn't care for themselves. And what better way to show the love of God than to show it towards somebody who can't reciprocate in any way, shape, or form? And think about James's audience, the trials and things that they were going through. If they were going through a kind of persecution where husbands and fathers were being killed because of their faith, in the situation that those widows and orphans found themselves in, what better way to show the love of God in the midst of their hurt and pain than to be there for them in that? All right, I need to wrap up. So I want the worship team come on up and close with the song. And as they're coming up, I just want to say this. The Christian faith... It's not a spectator sport. And some of us have been sitting in the church too long. And we've just been listeners. But we need to be, go from being listeners to becoming doers. Not only because it's good for our walk with the Lord, and it's good because this is what God has got, but it, it'll help us navigate those hard times. You know, all you college students, when's the time to study for a test? Is it the morning of or the minute before you're walking in? I know that's happened for some of you, right? The time to study for the test is before the day of the test. If we're learning to do what God has called us to do before those trials and temptations come, we'll be ready to face them when they do come. <laughs>